Hey folks, welcome back to Combo Class, where today uh, we're going to look at some very interesting ways that you can prove that some numbers are irrational. Now, to get our terms clear, an integer is like a whole number but including zeros and negatives, and a rational number is a number that can be expressed as some fraction of two integers, whereas an irrational number can't. And irrational numbers can also be recognized as the numbers that when written in a decimal form have an infinite amount of non-repeating digits after the decimal point. But what if you encountered some number in the wild? Like if you were looking at a square and figured out that based on the Pythagorean theorem, the diagonal of a square will be exactly square root of two times as long as one of the sides. Well, how could we show that square root of two, which seems to have an infinite non-repeating decimal that goes on forever, actually does, that it can't be expressed as any fraction of integers, and that no matter how far we look in that decimal, we would never find an end where it just goes to zeros, or a period that repeats forever. Well, today we're gonna look at some ways in which mathematicians can prove for sure that certain numbers like square root of two and other numbers like pi are definitely irrational. Some numbers are more difficult than others to try and prove whether they're irrational. So let's begin with a number that has the simplest irrationality proof I have ever encountered. The number logarithm base two of three, which basically means whichever number two has to raise to the power of to reach three. And to prove that this is irrational, we're gonna use a proof by contradiction, seeing what if it was some rational fraction or another, and then proving that causes some contradiction and would be impossible. So imagining that two to the power of some fraction did equal three to see where a contradiction might be, we can raise each side of this equation to the power of b to simplify this to two to the power of a equals three to the power of b. Now looking at this a and b, we can easily verify that this logarithm would have to be something positive and that neither of these would be zero or negative. But wait, two to the power of any positive integer is always even, and three to the power of any positive integer is always odd. So this would be saying that some even number equals some odd number, which is a contradiction. It's impossible, and that shows us that this could never have been the case to begin with. Log base two of three cannot be expressed as a fraction that way and must be irrational. But this is just the tip of the iceberg. Not all numbers are as easy to do this with as logarithms. Now let's move onward to the number the square root of two which shows up all over geometry and actually has an interesting history related to its irrationality because the ancient Pythagorean society loved numbers like this and believed that there was some fraction that must represent them with some numerator or denominator. And there's even rumors that when they found out that that was impossible, that this was an irrational number, that they drowned the guy who proved that. I don't know if I believe that part, but they certainly were quite baffled at the fact that this number could not be expressed as a fraction of two integers. But how was that proven? Because at first they were just wondering, maybe we haven't calculated enough digits of it. Maybe it's some 12 digit number divided by some other 12 digit number that turns out to be the secret fraction there. But we can prove that that's impossible by using a 
a somewhat similar technique to what we used before, where we assume what if this did equal a fraction of two integers, and then use a proof by contradiction to show that that's impossible. Now here we are going to have to use the additional step of noting that the fraction A over B we're talking about here is the potential simplest form of whatever fraction this theoretically could be represented by. The simplest form of a fraction is when you simplify something like four-sixths down to two-thirds, and any fraction of two integers has some simplest form where the numerator and denominator have no factors larger than one in common. So let's assume that square root of two did have some fraction that represented it, and we're gonna be looking at the simplest form of that fraction. Well, if we square both sides of this potential equation, we get that two equals a squared over b squared, and we could multiply both sides of that by b squared to get that two times b squared equals a squared. And since b, was an integer, b squared will be some whole number, and knowing that a squared is twice that whole number means that a squared must be even. This also tells us that a itself is even, because if the square of an integer is even, so was that integer. If a had been odd, then a squared would be odd and couldn't be expressed as twice that. Now, knowing that a is even, we can express a in the form of twice some other integer, which we'll call k. So a can be expressed as 2k for some k or another. And let's substitute this in to our original equation. Now we have square root of 2 equals 2k over b. And if we square both sides of that, what we end up with is that two equals four times k squared divided by b squared. And now let's multiply both sides of that by b squared to get that two times b squared equals four times k squared. We can divide each side of this by two to get that b squared equals two k squared. And kind of similar to before, since k is some integer, then twice k squared must be an even quantity. So b squared must be even, meaning that b itself must also be even. So we've now demonstrated that if this was true, that a is even, and so is b, but that contradicts our original assumption that we were looking at the simplest form of this fraction. If A and B are both even, they have a factor of two in common, and it wasn't the most simplified fraction. Now, even if we tried to assume maybe we got it wrong and we accidentally hadn't been talking about the simplest fraction, well, what would happen when we simplify it then and apply this same chain of logic? Well, there must be some simplest form of a fraction if it represented this number, and whatever that simplest form was leads to this contradiction where these were both even and it wasn't the simplest form. Meaning that once again, we have a proof by contradiction and the square root of two cannot be expressed as a fraction of two integers. Now, if any of you want your own challenge, you can try and see if you can prove using a similar technique that any other square roots, like the square root of some other non-square whole number, are also irrational. But moving past square roots, what about numbers like pi or the other classic irrational number e? These numbers are much trickier to prove the irrationality of. However, in the 1700s, at different times, it was proven 
that pi was irrational and that e was irrational using quite complicated proofs that relied on facts based around the continued fraction representations of these numbers. And over time, simplifications of these proofs have emerged, although still not quite simple enough for me to quickly explain a digestible version of any of the proofs of Pi's irrationality right here, there is one pretty simple proof of E's irrationality that I'll show on the screen here. And this one's kind of fun because it's a proof by contradiction that ends up showing that if E was a rational number, there would have to be a whole number between zero and one. And that's not even the end of these sort of proofs because there are different subcategories within irrational numbers. For example, the square root of two is irrational, but it is a solution to the simple polynomial equation x squared equals two, whereas pi and e are not the solution to any typical algebraic expression like that. And that makes them a category of number known as transcendental. And these transcendental numbers, like pi or e, are a subcategory of irrational numbers that require proofs of their own. And mathematicians have been able to prove that pi and e are transcendental numbers, but those proofs are even more complicated than the irrationality ones. Now, if you analyze the number line, you'll find that almost all of the numbers on it are irrational. Like, if we were somehow able to randomly pick a number on it, we would be essentially guaranteed it would be irrational. As I covered in an earlier episode, although there's an infinite amount of fractions and infinite amount of irrational numbers on some stretch of number line, like between zero and one, there's a larger infinity of how many irrational numbers are there compared to the rationals. So if we found a random number in a formula somewhere, could we assume that it was irrational, given that basically 100% of the numbers on any stretch of number line are irrational? Well, not really, because some formulas end up generating numbers that do end up turning out to be rational, even when it's sometimes a surprise. One funny historical example was the mathematician Legendre analyzing the prime counting function, or how many primes exist up to different points of number line that we'll say counting up to x, for example. Well, although where the primes land still has a lot of mysteries, the amount of primes does get closer and closer as we look at larger stretches of number line to something this formula can approximate x, the amount we were looking at of number line, divided by a logarithm with the base of e, often called the natural logarithm of x, minus some constant that became nicknamed Legendre's constant. And when analyzing what seems to be a relatively big stretch of number line, it appeared that this constant was somewhere around 1.083, but not exactly, and it was a number that many people believed might be irrational. But it turns out that when you look at a much larger stretch of number line, this approximation becomes closer to its true form, and B ends up turning out to be less than 1.08, what it actually approaches is a value of b that's not only rational, but also much lower than 1.08, much closer to the number 1. And in fact, it turns out that Legendre's constant, this b there, is exactly equal to 1. 
Although originally it was suspected to be a number around 1.08 that might be irrational, now Legendre's constant is sort of just a funny nickname for the number one. So if this number that some people thought might be irrational turned out to literally be the number one, it makes you wonder about other numbers that are unknown as to whether they're rational or irrational, whether we might someday find some new proof technique to prove they're irrational, or whether we might find some fraction that represents them. Even nowadays, there are many numbers that are mysteries as to whether they're definitely irrational or could have some surprise where they turn out to be some rational fraction of some really big numerator and really big denominator. For example, the sum of the two classic irrational numbers pi plus e, this whole quantity hasn't been proven yet that it's irrational. It most likely is, but who knows if or when mathematicians will come up with some new irrationality proving technique to be able to prove that these different classes of numbers are also irrational. Lots of mysteries remain here, so perhaps we will see this topic again in the future. And special thanks to the people who helped make this show possible, such as my patrons. Patreon supporters. And thank you all for joining me today. I'll catch you in the next one.